of eruptions of ashes and molten lava, which, flowing over the lips of its several craters, grew outward and upward like the trunk of a knotty exogenous tree. Then followed a strange contrast. The glacial winter came on, loading the cooling mountain with ice, which flowed slowly outward in every direction, radiating from the summit in the form of one vast conical glacier, a down-crawling mantle of ice upon a fountain of smoldering fire, crushing and grinding for centuries its brown, flinty lavas with incessant activity and thus degrading and remodeling the entire mountain. When, at length, the glacial period began to draw near its close, the ice mantle was gradually melted off around the bottom, and, in receding and breaking into its present fragmentary condition, irregular rings and heaps of moraine matter were stored upon its flanks. The glacial erosion of most of the Shasta lavas produces detritus, composed of rough, subangular boulders of moderate size and of porous gravel and sand, which yields freely to the transporting power of running water. Magnificent floods from the ample fountains of ice and snow working with sublime energy upon this prepared glacial detritus sorted it out and carried down immense quantities from the higher slopes, and reformed it in smooth, delta-like beds around the base, and it is these floodbeds joined together that now form the main honeyzone of the old volcano. Thus, by forces seemingly antagonistic and destructive, has Mother Nature accomplished her beneficent designs. Now a flood of fire, now a flood of ice, now a flood of water, and at length an outburst of organic life, a milky way of snowy petals and wings, girdling the rugged mountain like a cloud, as if the vivifying sunbeams beating against its sides had broken into a foam of plant bloom and bees, as sea waves break and bloom on a rock shore. In this flowery wilderness the bees rove and revel, rejoicing in the bounty of the sun, clambering eagerly through bramble and huckle bloom, ringing the myriad bells of the manzanita, now humming aloft among polony willows and firs, now down on the ashy ground among gilias and buttercups, and anon plunging deep into snowy banks of cherry and buckthorn. They consider the lilies and roll into them, and, like lilies, they toil not, for they are impelled by sun power, as water wheels by water power, and when the one has plenty of high-pressure water, the other plenty of sunshine, they hum and quiver alike. Sauntering in the Shasta bee lands in the sun days of summer, one may readily infer the time of day from the comparative energy of bee movements alone, drowsy and moderate in the cool of the morning, increasing in energy with the ascending sun, and, at high noon, thrilling and quivering in wild ecstasy, then gradually declining again to the stillness of night. In my excursions among the glaciers I occasionally meet bees that are hungry, like mountaineers who venture too far and remain too long above the breadline, then they droop and wither like autumn leaves. The Shasta bees are perhaps better fed than any others in the Sierra. Their field work is one perpetual feast, but... However exhilarating the sunshine or bountiful the supply of flowers, they are always dainty feeders. Humming moths and hummingbirds seldom set foot upon a flower, but poise on the wing in front of it, and reach forward as if they were sucking through straws. But bees, though, as dainty as they, hug their favorite flowers with profound cordiality, 
and push their blunt, polony faces against them, like babies on their mother's bosom. And fondly, too, with eternal love, does Mother Nature clasp her small bee babies, and suckle them, multitudes at once, on her warm Shasta breast. Besides the common honeybee there are many other species here, fine mossy, burly fellows, who were nourished on the mountains thousands of sunny seasons before the advent of the domestic species. Among these are the bumblebees, mason bees, carpenter bees, and leaf cutters. Butterflies, too, and moths of every size and pattern some broad-winged like bats, flapping slowly, and sailing in easy curves, others like small, flying violets, shaking about loosely in short, crooked flights close to the flowers, feasting luxuriously night and day. Great numbers of deer also delight to dwell in the brushy portions of the bee pastures. Bears, too roam the sweet wilderness, their blunt, shaggy forms harmonizing well with the trees and tangled bushes, and with the bees, also, notwithstanding the disparity in size. They are fond of all good things, and enjoy them to the utmost, with but little troublesome discrimination, flowers and leaves as well as berries and the bees themselves as well as their honey. Though the California bears have as yet had but little experience with honeybees, they often succeed in reaching their bountiful stores, and it seems doubtful whether bees themselves enjoy honey with so great a relish. By means of their powerful teeth and claws they can gnaw and tear open almost any hive conveniently accessible. Most honeybees, however, in search of a home are wise enough to make choice of a hollow in a living tree, a considerable distance above the ground, when such places are to be had, then they are pretty secure. For though the smaller black and brown bears climb well, they are unable to break into strong hives while compelled to exert themselves to keep from falling, and at the same time to endure the stings of the fighting bees without having their paws free to rub them off. But woe to the black bumblebees discovered in their mossy nests in the ground. With a few strokes of their huge paws the bears uncover the entire establishment, and, before time is given for a general buzz, bees old and young, larvae, honey, stings, nest, and all are taken in one ravishing mouthful. Not the least influential of the agents concerned in the superior sweetness of the Shasta flora are its storms. Storms I mean that are strictly local, bred and born on the mountain. The magical rapidity with which they are grown on the mountain top, and bestow their charity in rain and snow, never fails to astonish the inexperienced lowlander. Often in calm, glowing days, while the bees are still on the wing, a storm cloud may be seen far above in the pure ether, swelling its pearl bosses, and growing silently, like a plant. Presently a clear, ringing discharge of thunder is heard, followed by a rush of wind that comes sounding over the bending woods like the roar of the ocean, mingling raindrops, snow flowers, honey flowers, and bees in wild storm harmony. Still more impressive are the warm, reviving days of spring in the mountain pastures. The blood of the plants throbbing beneath the life-giving sunshine seems to be heard and felt. Plant growth goes on before our eyes, and every tree in the woods, and every bush and flower is seen as a hive of restless industry. 
The deeps of the sky are mottled with singing wings of every tone and color, clouds of brilliant chrysididae dancing and swirling in exquisite rhythm, golden barred vespidae, dragonflies, butterflies, grating cicadas, and jolly, rattling grasshoppers, fairly enameling the light. In the San Gabriel Valley. White Sage On bright, crisp mornings a striking optical effect may frequently be observed from the shadows of the higher mountains while the sunbeams are pouring past overhead. Then every insect, no matter what may be its own proper color, burns white in the light. Gauzy-winged hymenoptera, moths, jet black beetles, all are transfigured alike in pure, spiritual white, like snowflakes. In Southern California, where bee culture has had so much skillful attention of late years, the pasturage is not more abundant, or more advantageously varied as to the number of its honey plants and their distribution over mountain and plain than that of many other portions of the state where the industrial currents flow in other channels. The famous white sage, Audibashia, belonging to the mint family, flourishes here in all its glory, blooming in May, and yielding great quantities of clear, pale honey, which is greatly prized in every market it has yet reached. This species grows chiefly in the valleys and low hills. The black sage on the mountains is part of a dense, thorny chaparral, which is composed chiefly of adenostoma, ceanothus, manzanita, and cherry, not differing greatly from that of the southern portion of the Sierra, but more dense and continuous, and taller and remaining longer in bloom. Streamside gardens, so charming a feature of both the Sierra and coast mountains, are less numerous in Southern California, but they are exceedingly rich in honey flowers, wherever found, Melilitus, Columbine, Collinsia, Verbena, Zorschneria, Wild Rose, Honeysuckle, Philadelphus and lilies rising from the warm, moist dells in a very storm of exuberance. Wild buckwheat of many species is developed in abundance over the dry, sandy valleys and lower slopes of the mountains, toward the end of summer, and is, at this time, the main dependence of the bees, reinforced here and there by orange groves, alfalfa fields and small home gardens. The main honey months, in ordinary seasons, are April, May, June, July, and August, while the other months are usually flowery enough to yield sufficient for the bees. According to Mr. J.T. Gordon, President of the Los Angeles County Beekeepers Association, the first bees introduced into the county were a single hive, which cost $150 in San Francisco, and arrived in September, 1854. One, in April, of the following year, this hive sent out two swarms, which were sold for $100 each. From this small beginning the bees gradually multiplied to about 3,000 swarms in the year 1873. In 1876 it was estimated that there were between 15,000 and 20,000 hives in the county, producing an annual yield of about 100 pounds to the hive, in some exceptional cases, a much greater yield. In San Diego County, at the beginning of the season of 1878, there were about 24,000 hives, and the shipments from the one port of San Diego for the same year, 
from the 17th of July to the 10th of November, were 1,071 barrels, 15,544 cases, and nearly 90 tons. The largest bee ranches have about a thousand hives, and are carefully and skillfully managed, every scientific appliance of merit being brought into use. There are few beekeepers, however, who own half as many as this, or who give their undivided attention to the business. Orange culture, at present is heavily overshadowing every other business. A good many of the so-called bee ranches of Los Angeles and San Diego counties are still of the rudest pioneer kind imaginable. A man unsuccessful in everything else hears the interesting story of the profits and comforts of beekeeping, and concludes to try it, he buys a few colonies or gets them, from some overstocked ranch on shares, takes them back to the foot of some cannon, where the pasturage is fresh, squats on the land, with, or without, the permission of the owner, sets up his hives, makes a box cabin for himself, scarcely bigger than a beehive, and awaits his fortune. Bees suffer sadly from famine during the dry years which occasionally occur in the southern and middle portions of the state. If the rainfall amounts only to 3 or 4 inches, instead of from 12 to 20, as in ordinary seasons, then sheep and cattle die in thousands, and so do these small, winged cattle, unless they are carefully fed or removed to other pastures. The year 1877 will long be remembered as exceptionally rainless and distressing. Scarcely a flower bloomed on the dry valleys away from the stream sides, and not a single grain field depending upon rain was reaped. The seed only sprouted, came up a little way, and withered. Horses, cattle, and sheep grew thinner day by day, nibbling at bushes and weeds, along the shallowing edges of streams, many of which were dried up altogether, for the first time since the settlement of the country. A bee ranch on a spur of the San Gabriel Range. Cardinal Flower in the course of a trip I made during the summer of that year through Monterey, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties, the deplorable effects of the drought were everywhere visible, leafless fields, dead and dying cattle, dead bees, and half-dead people with dusty, doleful faces. Even the birds and squirrels were in distress, though their suffering was less painfully apparent than that of the poor cattle. These were falling one by one in slow, sure starvation along the banks of the hot, sluggish streams, while thousands of buzzards correspondingly fat were sailing above them, or standing gorged on the ground beneath the trees waiting with easy faith for fresh carcasses. The quails, prudently considering the hard times, abandoned all thought of pairing. They were too poor to marry, and so continued in flocks all through the year without attempting to rear young. The ground squirrels, though an exceptionally industrious and enterprising race, as every farmer knows, were hard pushed for a living, not a fresh leaf or seed was to be found save in the trees, whose bossy masses of dark green foliage presented a striking contrast to the ashen baldness of the ground beneath them. The squirrels, leaving their accustomed feeding grounds, betook themselves to the leafy oaks to gnaw out the acorn stores of the provident woodpeckers, 
but the latter kept up a vigilant watch upon their movements. I noticed four woodpeckers in league against one squirrel, driving the poor fellow out of an oak that they claimed. He dodged round the knotty trunk from side to side, as nimbly as he could in his famished condition, only to find a sharp bill everywhere. But the fate of the bees that year seemed the saddest of all. In different portions of Los Angeles and San Diego counties, from one half to three fourths of them died of sheer starvation. Not less than 18,000 colonies perished in these two counties alone, while in the adjacent counties the death rate was hardly less. Wild Buckwheat Dot, a bee ranch in the wilderness. Even the colonies nearest to the mountains suffered this year, for the smaller vegetation on the foothills was affected by the drought almost as severely as that of the valleys and plains, and even the hardy, deep-rooted chaparral, the surest dependence of the bees, bloomed sparingly while much of it was beyond reach. Every swarm could have been saved, however, by promptly supplying them with food when their own stores began to fail, and before they became enfeebled and discouraged, or by cutting roads back into the mountains, and taking them into the heart of the flowery chaparral. The Santa Lucia, San Rafael, San Gabriel, San Jacinto, and San Bernardino ranges are almost untouched as yet save by the wild bees. Some idea of their resources, and of the advantages and disadvantages they offer to beekeepers, may be formed from an excursion that I made into the San Gabriel range about the beginning of August of the dry year. This range containing most of the characteristic features of the other ranges just mentioned, overlooks the Los Angeles vineyards and orange groves from the north, and is more rigidly inaccessible in the ordinary meaning of the word than any other that I ever attempted to penetrate. The slopes are exceptionally steep and insecure to the foot and they are covered with thorny bushes from 5 to 10 feet high. With the exception of little spots not visible in general views, the entire surface is covered with them, massed in close hedge growth, sweeping gracefully down into every gorge and hollow, and swelling over every ridge and summit in shaggy, ungovernable exuberance offering more honey to the acre for half the year than the most crowded clover field. But when beheld from the open San Gabriel Valley, beaten with dry sunshine, all that was seen of the range seemed to wear a forbidding aspect. From base to summit all seemed grey, barren, silent its glorious chaparral appearing like dry moss creeping over its dull, wrinkled ridges and hollows. Setting out from Pesadena, I reached the foot of the range about sundown, and being weary and heated with my walk across the shadeless valley, concluded to camp for the night. After resting a few moments, I began to look about among the flood boulders of Eaton Creek for a campground, when I came upon a strange, dark-looking man who had been chopping cordwood. He seemed surprised at seeing me, so I sat down with him on the live oak log he had been cutting, and made haste to give a reason for my appearance in his solitude explaining that I was anxious to find out something about the mountains, and meant to make my way up Eaton Creek next morning. Then he kindly invited me to camp with him, and led me to his little cabin, situated at the foot of the mountains, where a small spring oozes out of a bank overgrown with wild rose bushes. 
After supper, when the daylight was gone, he explained that he was out of candles, so we sat in the dark, while he gave me a sketch of his life in a mixture of Spanish and English. He was born in Mexico, his father Irish, his mother Spanish. He had been a miner, rancher, prospector, hunter, etc., rambling always, and wearing his life away in mere waste, but now he was going to settle down. His past life, he said, was of no account but the future was promising. He was going to make money and marry a Spanish woman. People mine here for water as for gold. He had been running a tunnel into a spur of the mountain back of his cabin. My prospect is good he said, and if I chance to strike a good, strong flow, I'll soon be worth $5,000 or $10,000. For that flat out there referring to a small irregular patch of Boldera e detritus, two or three acres in size, that had been deposited by Eaton Creek during some flood season, that flat is large enough for a nice orange grove, and the bank behind the cabin will do for a vineyard, and after watering my own trees and vines I will have some water left to sell to my neighbors below me, down the valley. And then he continued, I can keep bees, and make money that way, too, for the mountains above here are just full of honey in the summertime, and one of my neighbors down here says that he will let me have a whole lot of hives, on shares, to start with. You see I've a good thing, I'm all right now. All this prospective affluence in the sunken, boulder choked floodbed of a mountain stream. Leaving the bees out of the count, most fortune seekers would as soon think of settling on the summit of Mount Shasta. Next morning, wishing my hopeful entertainer good luck, I set out on my shaggy excursion. A bee pasture on the moraine desert, Spanish Bernet. About half an hour's walk above the cabin, I came to the fall famous throughout the valley settlements as the finest yet discovered in the San Gabriel Mountains. It is a charming little thing, with a low, sweet voice, singing like a bird, as it pours from a notch in a short ledge, some thirty-five or forty feet into a round mirror pool. The face of the cliff back of it, and on both sides, is smoothly covered and embossed with mosses, against which the white water shines out in showy relief, like a silver instrument in a velvet case. Hither come the San Gabriel lads and lasses, to gather ferns and dabble away their hot holidays in the cool water glad to escape from their commonplace palm gardens and orange groves. The delicate maiden hair grows on fissured rocks within reach of the spray, while broad-leaved maples and sycamores cast soft, mellow shade over a rich profusion of bee flowers, growing among boulders in front of the pool, the fall, the flowers, the bees, the ferny rocks and leafy shade forming a charming little poem of wildness, the last of a series extending down the flowery slopes of Mount San Antonio through the rugged, foam-beaten bosses of the main Eaton Canyon. From the base of the fall I followed the ridge that forms the western rim of the Eaton Basin to the summit of one of the principal peaks which is about 5,000 feet above sea level. Then, turning eastward, I crossed the middle of the basin, forcing a way over its many subordinate ridges and across its eastern rim, 
having to contend almost everywhere with the floweriest and most impenetrable growth of honey bushes I had ever encountered since first my mountaineering began. Most of the Shasta Chaparral is leafy nearly to the ground, here the main stems are naked for three or four feet, and interspiked with dead twigs forming a stiff chevaux de frise through which even the bears make their way with difficulty. I was compelled to creep for miles on all fours, and in following the bear trails often found tufts of hair on the bushes where they had forced themselves through. For 100 feet or so above the fall the ascent was made possible only by tough cushions of club moss that clung to the rock. Above this the ridge weathers away to a thin knife blade for a few hundred yards, and thence to the summit of the range it carries a bristly mane of chaparral. Here and there small openings occur on rocky places commanding fine views across the cultivated valley to the ocean. These I found by the tracks were favorite outlooks and resting places for the wild animals, bears, wolves, foxes, wildcats, etc., which abound here, and would have to be taken into account in the establishment of bee ranches. In the deepest thickets I found woodrat villages, groups of huts four to six feet high, built of sticks and leaves in rough, tapering piles, like muskrat cabins. I noticed a good many bees, too, most of them wild. The tame honeybees seemed languid and wing-weary, as if they had come all the way up from the flowerless valley. After reaching the summit I had time to make only a hasty survey of the basin, now glowing in the sunset gold, before hastening down into one of the tributary canons in search of water. Emerging from a particularly tedious breadth of chaparral, I found myself free and erect in a beautiful park-like grove of mountain live oak where the ground was planted with aspidiums and briar roses, while the glossy foliage made a close canopy overhead, leaving the grey dividing trunks bare to show the beauty of their interlacing arches. The bottom of the cannon was dry where I first reached it, but a bunch of scarlet mimulus indicated water at no great distance and I soon discovered about a bucket full in a hollow of the rock. This, however, was full of dead bees, wasps, beetles, and leaves, well steeped and simmered, and would, therefore, require boiling and filtering through fresh charcoal before it could be made available. Tracing the dry channel about a mile farther down to its junction with a larger tributary cannon, I at length discovered a lot of boulder pools, clear as crystal, brimming full, and linked together by glistening streamlets just strong enough to sing audibly. Flowers in full bloom adorned their margins, lilies ten feet high, larkspur, columbines and luxuriant ferns, leaning and overarching in lavish abundance, while a noble old live oak spread its rugged arms over all. Here I camped, making my bed on smooth cobblestones. A beekeeper's cabin dot, burilia, above, dot, media, below. Next day, in the channel of a tributary that heads on Mount San Antonio, I passed about fifteen or twenty gardens like the one in which I slept, lilies in every one of them, in the full pomp of bloom. My third camp was made near the middle of the general basin, at the head of a long system of cascades from ten to two hundred feet high one following the other in close succession down a rocky, inaccessible canon, 
making a total descent of nearly 1,700 feet. Above the Cascades the main stream passes through a series of open, sunny levels, the largest of which are about an acre in size, where the wild bees and their companions were feasting on a showy growth of Zorschneria, painted cups, and monodola, and grey squirrels were busy harvesting the burrs of the Douglas spruce, the only conifer I met in the basin. The eastern slopes of the basin are in every way similar to those we have described, and the same may be said of other portions of the range. From the highest summit, far as the eye could reach, the landscape was one vast bee pasture, a rolling wilderness of honey bloom, scarcely broken by bits of forest or the rocky outcrops of hilltops and ridges. Behind the San Bernardino range lies the wild sagebrush country bounded on the east by the Colorado River, and extending in a general northerly direction to Nevada and along the eastern base of the Sierra beyond Mono Lake. The greater portion of this immense region, including Owens Valley, Death Valley, and the sink of the Mojave, the area of which is nearly one-fifth that of the entire state, is usually regarded as a desert, not because of any lack in the soil, but for want of rain, and rivers available for irrigation. Very little of it, however, is desert in the eyes of a bee. Looking now over all the available pastures of California, it appears that the business of beekeeping is still in its infancy. Even in the more enterprising of the southern counties, where so vigorous a beginning has been made, less than a tenth of their honey resources have as yet been developed, while in the Great Plain, the coast ranges, the Sierra Nevada, and the northern region about Mount Shasta, the business can hardly be said to exist at all. What the limits of its developments in the future may be, with the advantages of cheaper transportation and the invention of better methods in general, it is not easy to guess. Nor, on the other hand, are we able to measure the influence on bee interests likely to follow the destruction of the forests now rapidly falling before fire and the axe. As to the sheep evil, that can hardly become greater than it is at the present day. In short, notwithstanding the widespread deterioration and destruction of every kind already effected, California, with her incomparable climate and flora, is still, as far as I know, the best of all the bee lands of the world. 1. 15 hives of Italian bees were introduced into Los Angeles County in 1855, and in 1876 they had increased to 500. The marked superiority claimed for them over the common species is now attracting considerable attention. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook The Mountains of California asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works. So the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. 
Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an e-book, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this e-book, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by US copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license The full Project Gutenberg license Please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property trademark forward slash copyright agreement if you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of project gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession if you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, 
We hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D the copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.E Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.E.1 1 .E the following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.E.2 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.E.1 through 1.E.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.E.8 or 1.E.9. 1.E.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.E.1 through 1.E.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.E.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work 
or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9
If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the foundation as set forth in section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement, Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, 
the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity You agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production. Promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and, c. Any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Project Gutenberg trademark symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001 the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help. See Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3. Educational Corporation organized under the laws of the State of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116. 801-596-1887 Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4. 
Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years. He produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. The Mountains of California Contents List of Illustrations Chapter I The Sierra Nevada Chapter II The Glaciers Chapter Three, The Snow Snow Banners Chapter Four, A Near View of the High Sierra Chapter V The Passes Chapter Six, The Glacier Lakes Shadow Lake Orange Lake Lake Starking Chapter Seven, The Glacier Meadows Hanging Meadows Chapter Eight, The Forests The Nut Pine Pinus sabiniana, Pinus tuberculata sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana, yellow, 
or silver pine, Pinus ponderosa, Douglas spruce, Pseudotsuga. Douglasii, incense cedar, Libocedrus decurrens, white silver fir, Abbeys can color, magnificent silver fir, or red fir, Abbeys magnifica, big tree, Sequoia giganti, two leaved, or tamarack, pine, Pinus contorta, var. mariana, mountain pine, Pinus monticola, juniper, or red cedar, Junipirus occidentalis, hemlock spruce, Zugapatoniana, dwarf pine, Pinus albicollis, white pine, Pinus flexilis, needle pine, Pinus aristata, nut pine, Pinus monophylla. Chapter 9 The Douglas Squirrel, Cirrus. Douglasii. Chapter X A Windstorm in the Forests Chapter 11 The River Floods Chapter 12 Sierra Thunderstorms Chapter 13 The Water Oozel Chapter 14 The Wild Sheep, Ovis Montana Chapter 15 In the Sierra Foothills Chapter 16 The Bee Pastures The Full Project Gutenberg License